you know, one thing I was thinking we talk about cookie-less world. It's not really a cookie-less world. It's a third-party cookie-less world. That just doesn't roll off the tongue as much, so everyone just sort of shortens it to a cookie-less world. You know, first-party cookies are still within the Safari environment, Firefox environment. They're fine, and they're still critical to the whole digital ecosystem because you want to be as a publisher or the owner of the site, you know, someone's a subscriber or you know, other. There's first-party fuels a lot of the infrastructure, so that's still fine. The third-party cookie going away, though, it's going to have a significant impact. I mean, you already see the uh, the impact on you know CPMs, uh, in engagement or knowledge of the user when on the Safari in the Firefox browser. I think everyone's kind of waiting for the other shoe, the big shoe to drop with Chrome, because uh, I think they make 65% of the market here in the U.S. And should they follow the same path as uh, as Apple or Safari or, or Firefox, you know, you're going to see a very uh, pretty serious impact on the broader ad tech ecosystem buyer's ability to use third-party data to track users. From a publisher perspective, it's, it's a complex, uh, it's going to be a complex change. There's no doubt it'll have a near-term impact on CPMs that come in through open auction, perhaps balanced out by an increase in contextual targeting. But you know, overall though, I mean, we have that direct relationship with our users. So they're coming to our sites. So when we drop for our own needs, analytics, um, you know, gathering data, that's a first-party cookie. And that's going to be fine. So I think that that you know, puts us in some way a, a, we're in a privileged position to begin with it. We have that direct relationship with the user. We actually, whenever you have a privilege, you don't want to abuse it and you want to make sure you use it in the right way. That's why we take it very seriously. Any of the privacy regimes that are out of, you know, out of California, you know, Nevada emerging, obviously GDPR. So, uh, you know, as long as you adhere to the regulation, uh, as long as you don't, you're not abusive of the user experience, you know, we have that great relationship with our users. And I think that publishers, collectively, and News Corp in particular, will be in a, a strong place, no matter how this all shakes out in the coming months and years. So Chris, could you just explain about News IQ and where sure. it sits in the ecosystem uh, with the buy side? Sure. You know, News IQ is, uh, it, it's, look at it as sort of a collective asset of News Corp. You know, we have these great business units uh, in the US, of course, Dow Jones and Realtor and New York Post, News American Marketing, over in Europe, News UK, with great publications like the Times of London and The Sun. News Australia, which has dozens of, of publications across news and lifestyle. And you know, News IQ, though, is about taking advantage of the great brands, the audience relationships, uh, the data that, are, are that these business use have built up, and also the advertising relationships have built up over the years. So it's about something to supplement and complement what's been done at the business unit level. And it's anchored on sort of two areas. One, as we think through our ad tech stack and how we're leveraging pre-bid, to have a more transparent auction process and, and make sure that our buyers can come in and, and know when they're bidding on our inventory, it's not going to a black box. So that's sort of the, the infrastructure part of things. But then the other side is the first party data. And we've built a data gathering infrastructure, again, all within um, compliance, making sure we're actually sensitive to PII, and you know, be able to build out these uh, anonymized profiles of people, be able to target them across our properties and it's all around first party data. So our advertisers can go in with confidence that you know, with the browser changes and things like that, that data is not going to be, they'll still be able to target those users. And so um, you know, we, we increasingly engage with the buy side through our current reps, making sure they can execute via managed service, via a PMP, or any, basically any other path or, or channel they want to use to access our audience and, you know, and be part of our premium environment. And finally, Chris, tell us about the, uh, the sell side, the SSPs, and um, mm -hmm. uh, how that's changing um, sort of as a publisher, what you're looking for, and maybe some thoughts about um, sort of the consolidation or the changes in the SSP area. Sure. You know, I think that uh, you know, we continue to take a very broad look at the, the marketplace, our vendors. You know, we work with a number of SSPs. Uh, I think what, you know, in some and perhaps a more uh, elevated manner than others. I think what matters to us is, as we look at the SSP partners, is are they aligned with us about transparency and you know, all the way down to be able to share with, you know, give us access to log level data, which is fueling some of our analytics tools. Are they uh, innovative? Are you know, they continue to evolve the product? Um, are they removing, uh, or making, removing fraud or attempting to remove fraud from their, their own individual ecosystem? I think that uh, you know, it's here we are in end of 2019. Everyone's been talking about fraud for years. Yet uh, there was an article just the other week in, in BuzzFeed about all these local spoofing sites, which are sucking up a lot of advertiser spend, and you know, they're but they're all fake news. 
and but users may not know that. And so we still have this very, unfortunately, you know, festering uh, fraud environment going out there. And so we want to make sure we work with partners who are aligned with us and support premium advertising, you know, premium publishers like News Corp.